Thanks for inviting me here to speak about my PhD research. Um, so what am I doing? I am looking at artifacts. Um, it focuses on small metal artifacts and whether changes in the material expression of identity can tell us about social dynamics in the 5th to 9th century in Eastern England. Uh, by looking at the artifacts and the landscape associations, I am examining how they can tell us about the people who made them, used them and lost them. Uh, do wider geographic patterns show influences shifting from east to west or is societal change a more a localised process? Artifacts have always been fundamental within archaeology, um, but in the past they've often been used purely as, as dating objects or as functional objects, so what they were used for rather than their style and, and form and that sort of thing. Um, but more recently it's been noticed that artifacts can provide us with a much more detailed picture of society. So my research uses the uh, comparative analysis of over 4,000 metal artifacts from Suffolk to investigate patterns against the background of a rapidly changing political world. The rise of kingdoms, the increasing importance of overseas connections and migrations, um, the uh, changes to and from Europe, local versus national economics, all of these things will have played a part in um, influencing local identities. My data has come from two sources, uh, objects found by metal detectorists and recorded on the Port of Antiquities Scheme database, and uh, objects recovered from excavations, so both fully published excavations and those just available as grey literature. So the Port of Antiquities Scheme, for those of you who don't know, it's a, an online accessible database which covers uh, England and Wales, it doesn't cover Scotland. It's mainly used for objects found by metal detectorists. Um, it's, a, it's an invaluable resource, it's a brilliant resource, it's probably an underused resource if I'm completely honest, but as things stand, this, that screenshot is from the last few days, we've got over 1.3 million objects um, from across England and Wales. Um, 70,000 of these are from Suffolk, not all of them from the early medieval period. Um, again, for those of you who don't know, Suffolk is uh, in the east of England, forms part of the area known as East Anglia. Uh, it's bordered by Essex to the south, the big red dot is London. Um, you've got Cambridgeshire to the west, uh, sorry, to the east, Norfolk to the north, and there's an eastern coastline on the North Sea. So if we move on to the geology of the county, um, the main geological features were formed during the Anglian glaciation around 500,000 BC. Uh, the retreat of the ice resulted in the formation of the major river valleys of Suffolk. So you've got the Waveney to the, on the northern edge, through here, um, the Deben and the Gipping are here, and then the Stour along the southern border with Essex. So the county is relatively flat, uh, it's low lying, the highest point is only 136 metres above sea level in the west of the county, and land use is predominantly agricultural, so um, it makes it massively popular with metal detectorists. It's a really good place to, to be searching for, for things with metal detectors. So from the early medieval period, I said there were 70,000 objects in Suffolk, 3,300 of those are from the early medieval period. I'm not using all of those. Um, I've evaluated a total of 1,828 objects, um, which are specifically identifiable and which uh, have the right amount of data that I can use for the project. Um, they're shown here as individual points. There are several clusters um, which are more clearly visible through uh, heat mapping. So what we've got is the majority of finds associated with rivers and riverine deposits. So that's to be expected because those are the areas that would be more attractive as settlements. Um, and it's um, also supported by the, the, the associations with the, the heat, heat areas with settlements point here and um, uh, which them? Cemetery sites, sorry. <laughs> so cemetery sites, is, it's, it's all associated with, with the Port of Antiquities finds. Um, however, as Port of Antiquities finds are individual objects, in most cases they probably represent unplanned losses. So what they could present, represent is routeways or pathways between settlements where things are being lost. So people are travelling between these areas and losing things as they go along river valleys, possibly. 
Um, so although there are fires from the entire county, there are particularly large densities around um, I in the north, which is the uh, orange star, um, and Freckenham, which is the green star in the west, and the cemetery site of Codnam, which is the blue point right in the middle of the map there. These hotspots indicate large numbers of fires in a relatively small area. Um, it's most likely due to a small number of metal detectorists finding numerous objects in a single place. Um, in many cases, possibly even just one field. So um, many detectorists stick to a known area, um, which they repeatedly survey, particularly if they've been successful in the past. Um, and so uh, this could be why we're seeing some of these densities. For example, the, the PAS database said there's just two people who have recorded 116 objects between them in Codnam. So you can see that there are people who are using very, very small areas, and, and then most detectorists stick to a single parish. Um, so this is something that, that needs to be um, taken into account in the initial analysis that, uh, that's currently being undertaken on the, uh, on the data that I've collected. What I want to talk about now is a specific artifact type, wrist clasps. Um, and some of my preliminary results to do with the wrist clasp uh, data. So um, they are pairs of dress accessories used to fasten sleeves together. It's effectively a hook and eye. And so eat one part would be on one side of the sleeve, the other part on the other, you hook it together. Um, so whilst the basic concept remains the same, they do come in a variety of shapes and decoration. Um, they are a particularly Anglian artifact type with limited numbers elsewhere um, and are also relatively short lived. They appear in the late 5th century and go through to about 700 AD. In Britain, they are exclusively found in female graves and are usually associated with annular and cruciform brooch types, which again are a particularly Anglian type of brooch suite. Where they're found on the continent, which is Norway, Eastern Sweden and Denmark, they are actually also found in male graves. Um, and they're also found in different places. They're found by the ankles as well as the wrists. And they're also found in female graves um, on the chest sometimes. So they seem to have a wider range of uses on the continent than they do in, in Britain. So that's something that's quite interesting and, and needs a bit of further looking at with uh, the data that I'm looking at. So when they're recorded on the database, um, they are normally found singly. They're often found in pairs in graves because obviously you put a body in a specific place that doesn't move around. With the PAS, you've got um, accidental losses. So you usually only find one or two, which is what these examples uh, are here. When they're on the database, they're recorded using Heinz 1993 typology, uh, which assigns the objects to various groupings based on features including decorative elements, attachment methods, and production techniques. And these can then, then be assigned to date ranges. So for this project, I've examined the records of all 113 wrist clasps found in Suffolk and uh, recorded on the Portable Antiquities database. As with the map showing all the PAS artifacts, um, you can see they're primarily found on the line of rivers or in river iron deposits, again, as we would expect to, to do. Um, again, if we look at it as a heat map, you've got pretty much the same spread of results, that they're all associated with um, the settlements and the main settlement and uh, cemetery areas of the county. If we move on to, to this particular table, this shows the number of each type based on the earliest date that they're associated with. So the most common types here are B12 and B20, which date from the late 5th century into the 6th. Um, and there's a relatively even spread of the other types which first appear in this period and a fairly even spread of those later in the sequence as well. If we map those, there, isn't, there doesn't appear to be a particular pattern except for this River Iron um, Association. Um, and there's no particular pattern to the location of the different types based on their variants. They're all found in multiple parishes. If we look at B12, um, this shows the places where they've been found, and she, there are some groups here, so you're starting to see small patterns coming out. So you've got a little group in the, in the central northern area, over to the west, and you've got quite a big gap in this area here. So again, there is some, some grouping starting to appear when you actually narrow it down a little bit further. B20, again, you've got them kind of going in a bit of a band across there. You've got a couple here, but you've got none in that north. Uh, uh, northeast corner. So again, 
there are some small patterns starting to emerge. What becomes more interesting is if you add in data from cemeteries. When you look at uh, the excavations, I've, I've looked at, um, synth I've synthesized data from 292 excavations and HER reports. Um, and what happens is there are 69 risk clasps from nine cemetery sites. And of the 23 types in the combined data set, 74% have, have a much more significant chance of being either recorded on the PAS or found in a cemetery site. So you see there is a specific difference between the two types. When they're found in the PAS, they don't tend to be found in graves. So um, as it's generally accepted that the majority of Port of Antiquities finds represent accidental losses, uh, one reason for the difference might be that those in the database are everyday objects that are being um, lost as opposed to those from the grave uh, contexts that we're seeing. So again, if we now look at this, the most prevalent types from the excavations, um, this is B7. Again, they're county-wide, but you've got little points, little areas where they're up, particularly over in this western corner. Again, B13, there's eight examples of B13, but they're only found on three sites, all in the northern part, the northern half of the, of the county. So this is the sort of thing that I'm looking at, just trying to find patterns and looking at all sorts of different things. So this is both data sets, so PAS and excavated data. Um, risk classes that first appear from the late 5th century. Um, when they're plotted together, they show a distinct similarity, and this is actually supported by statistical analysis. So this is the result of a Ripley's K test, which tests spatial data um, to see whether things are clustered according to chance. So the red line which runs through the middle of that grey band, um, those represent what you would expect if those risk class were distributed by chance. You'd expect to see the black line within that, ba within that band of grey. Um, anything below that line represents purposeful distribution, but anything above the grey area represents clustering, clustering beyond what you'd expect by chance. So what this is showing is that there is a pattern. Now what it doesn't show you is what the pattern is. So what you then have to do is, is think about that a little bit more. So it could be geology, it could be detectorists uh, uh, in a particular area, artifact survival rates, or it could be to do with people's actions in the early medieval period. So, or a combination. So what we do know is that artifact survival is good in Suffolk. Detecting takes place county-wide. And because the test is based on combined data, so includes the excavation data as well, it is relatively safe to assume that this clustering is actually coming from people in the early medieval period. That's what I think. So what we've got again is, this is, this is further on, this is um, risk class, which first appeared at the beginning of the 6th century. Um, again, very similar positions. They all tend to be in this sort of area with a few outliers over here. This southern uh, southwest corner just seems to be, in the majority of cases, fairly devoid of risk clasps. Um, when you now look at the ones that from AD 551, so the later 6th century ones, they are all here. So something is happening. Something is happening in the um, way that that people are using wrist clasps. Um, so it's it's a change in the material culture in the county. And hopefully, these I can I can be able to to test this further with other artifact types and see whether we can get the same sort of data patterning. That would be be brilliant. But we will see. So, what are we actually looking at here? The majority of artifacts found in grave contexts are objects which have been specifically chosen for burial. The deposition is a final act in a series of interactions, a complex assemblage of people, things, emotions, places, everything else. Um, they've been put there for a reason. Something's happened which makes those objects different. Um, this is partly illustrated from the image here. So we've got a body being prepared for burial. Um, the body is in full view of all the mourners. You've got most of the most of the village seems to have come out to see what's happening and, and to be part of that ritual process. So the placing of the particular brooch that we see there, the great head square-headed brooch, the placing of that brooch means something. It's 
death of the person means that the brooch is now an alien object and can't stay with the community and needs to be with the deceased. Um, so whilst it might be assumed that objects used by a person daily would become those alien objects on their death, that risk class data that I showed you before actually seems to con contradict that. Actually, maybe the things that are being buried with these people are not the things they used every day, because those are the things that are being found on the Port of Antiquities database. So how to tie data to theory. I'll get on to theory now. I do apologize. <laughs> you caught me at the wrong part of my research, so I'm afraid I was a little bit data heavy there. But identity and, and how we're going to use the data to examine identity. Um, identity examine is usually examined in terms of, of society and social. In the social sciences, the term social designates a link. It's almost a physical thing. So in archaeology, isolated objects are only are often the, the only connection we have. Well, they are the only connection we have between past peoples and their societies. So how do we create the same sort of links? In view of the differences in the data sets I'm using, I'm proposing combined use of a biographical approach and use assemblage theory in um, trying to investigate identity and how these two things can be married together. So biographical approach, I'm sure you're all aware of. Um, the pioneered by Iger Kopitov, who proposed that you can produce a biography of a thing by asking the same questions as you would if you're doing a biography of a person. So fairly straightforward. This, the, the, the biggest um, project that I'm aware of anyway is um, Jodie Joy's 2009 work on Iron Age mirrors, which illustrates how um, you can produce a detailed history of an object and its relationship. And this reconstruction of, of this particular life of a mirror details the stages that the object went through and um, how these, these the relationships aren't just linear. They can be cross-merged and you know come in from all sorts of different directions. Um, and so it's, it's although a, a biography begins with an historical reconstruction, it expands to include all of the object's relationships. So, for example, what I propose doing is putting together biographies of specific artifact types and seeing how we can put those, whether things fit or whether they don't fit. So this is a late 5th to mid 6th century wrist clasp found in the parish of Hinderclay in the, on the Norfolk Suffolk border. Based on the shape, decoration and attachment points, it's been classified as type B12, again using Heinz's typology. Now, his work shown that this type has a really narrow distribution within Suffolk and Norfolk, again, suggesting an East Anglian manufacturer. Um, the remainder of the examples that aren't found in Norfolk and Suffolk are found along the eastern seaboard, along trading routes. And so we, there is a connection, definitely, and also a, a correlation with Ipswich Ware pottery. So we can use this to infer things about the people who wore it and extrapolate how people who saw them would have viewed them. The style would potentially mark that person out as a local to the area or someone with ties to the area through marriage or some sort of personal relationship. Um, it would also be possible to infer things about the identity of the person who made it. So people with the ability to work metal would have a specific status within their community because of that ability. So a biographical approach can be used at an individual level and particularly with objects recorded on the database um, because of their lack of specific contextual and stratigraphical information. Um, but because of the quantity of objects I'm looking at, we need, I, need, I need something else as well. So what I'm also going to be using is um, assemblage theory. So it's based on the work of Gilles Deleuze in the Southern Plateau where he proposed a theory designed to examine groups constructed of things from the size of atoms all the way up to ecosystems and, and the universe. Deleuze never really produced a fully fledged theory, but his work was developed by Manuel de Landa. And um, this highlights the importance of relationships between objects and their context. And in fact, the object itself can form the context that it's working from. So it becomes the focus of a group of things, which can include people, emotions, places and objects, and therefore works on a variety of levels. So I'm hoping that that will be able to bring together some of this disparate data that I've got. And I'm, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>